You're listening to Bully the Podcast. Join us as we chat with some of the most exciting and interesting people here in Malaysia and around the world. Welcome to another episode of Bully the Podcast. This time, our guest is Gayatri Raman. Gayatri comes from the little town of Sungai Seput in the state of Perak, Malaysia. Trained to be inquisitive by her parents, she is a lawyer by training whose career has taken many interesting turns. Today, she is managing director of publishing giant LexisNexis. We speak to her about that exciting journey, which fascinatingly takes us to her work in Myanmar and how she fought for democracy there. It also takes us to her meeting Aung San Suu Kyi. We at Bole are very proud to give you Gayatri Raman. Welcome to Bole, Thank the you. podcast. Thank you for saying yes to an interview. Thanks, Sambika. Um, well, I mean, there's so much to talk about. I hope we have enough time to do it. Uh, I know a lot of people uh, uh, appreciate your experience with Myanmar, and I think uh, we'd like to spend quite a lot of time on that, uh, what you were doing there, etc. But you are currently the managing director of LexisNexis Southeast Asia, and for the last 20 years, you have worked your way up the ranks in LexisNexis. Tell us, tell us about your journey. I started in LexisNexis in 2001. At that time, uh, I was hired to train uh, lawyers on using online legal research when lawyers preferred the books, the printed material. And um, I've asked for and uh, been given opportunities Uh, although based in Malaysia, but to travel outside of Malaysia across uh, the world on many different regional roles. Um, I led marketing for Southeast Asia, went into sales, uh, then developed product, created products, online products for LexisNexis, uh, and then became head of customer discovery and innovation across Asia. So I traveled to Japan, China, India, etc., just to speak to lawyers all over the region. Uh, and to understand what their needs are so that I can pull it into product development. And um, then I uh, began began getting a reputation within LexisNexis for my rule of law work. So all throughout, I've been passionate about it. I've been doing it, regardless of what my official job title was. And uh, my boss at the time in 2014 said, would you like to be head of rule of law uh, for the Asia-Pacific region? So I worked on, created, drafted my own job description within the organization then. It didn't exist. Um, And I thought to myself, this is the ideal role. Uh, And now we have several people with the same job description across the organization. And uh, when I took on the managing director role, I hired Hannah Lim, who now leads rule of law for my business for Southeast Asia. She used to be an attorney practicing in Myanmar. Um, and she's based in Singapore, so she has a lot of experience there, and we knew we had a lot of work uh, that we needed to do and wanted to do to support the democratization process in Myanmar. Uh, So I hired someone with that experience uh, just to work on that. So Right. Yep. So let me jump in there. So you you have been described as a rule of law campaigner. That, That is what you're best known for. And this has taken you to many, many countries, not just Myanmar. Maybe you can tell us to what other countries that you've been to. And then we'll come back and talk about rule of law in Myanmar. Okay. Um, I have worked on um, consolidating laws in the Maldives where laws are not consolidated because you have parent acts and then you have amendments to these acts which are stored in different places and then you can't get a good sense of what the status of the law is today. So we worked with uh, the Attorney General's office to consolidate legislation, translate them into English and make them available online as well. We worked with the Supreme Court of Myanmar again um, to determine a structure for writing judgments, uh, indexing, reporting judgments for the Maldives uh, as well. Um, I have led um, trips uh, across justice departments in different countries. So I led a, a, 
a congregation of Sri Lankan uh, legal professionals to visit South Africa to learn from them. So meeting with the South African Law Society, etc., those of them uh, as well, the Constitutional Court in South Africa as well. Um, and we've also worked similarly on judiciary training and consolidation of laws in the Fijian islands, so Fiji as well. And so it's um, where it is a developing country uh, and where uh, our skills are also served in creating the infrastructure for the country that is required. We support those countries in that way uh, as well. In Malaysia, where judgments are more readily available, then you know we work towards making uh, case law more enriched, easier to search, uh, you know, reporting it, putting a hit notes in, etc. Uh, as well. So I've travelled quite a bit. Um, just to work with uh, different organizations. Uh, and of course, we'll come to the Myanmar story, but uh, a, a lot of my time was also spent in Myanmar. Sorry, I just want to jump in there if I, if I, if I could. Um, and I mean, clearly you're, you're hugely experienced in your, in your travels um, uh, and, and, and the areas you've worked in and, you know, and you're, you're sort of won awards, you've won World Women Leadership Congress awards. But I'd like to dial this back a bit and find out how all this started in Sungai Siput. Yes. Uh, my dad and my mom still live there. And uh, I grew up, I think, because of my mixed parentage, uh, we didn't have to conform to any kind of norms. So we were encouraged to just question what didn't seem right, didn't feel right. Um, we were also encouraged to just reach out and ask people for help if we wanted to or give them our opinion if we wanted to. I'll give you an example. Um, I was 12 and I watched a documentary about uh, President Cory Aquino at that time. And I just admired her and I said she was fantastic and I wanted to reach out to her and write to her. And my dad just said, okay, so just write to her. So I took a pen to paper and I wrote and the address said President Cory Aquino. I didn't even know her full name. Manila, Philippines. He took me to the post office. I posted the letter. One month later, I had this huge package from Malacanang, from the palace itself, with fantastic information about the country, with a family picture from the president herself. Um, fast forward that 30 years later, I took that envelope to the National Archives when I was visiting the palace in the Philippines officially as a LexisNexis representatives. Uh, and the palace archives people took it and treated it for me with anti-acid paper and things like that so that I could store it, you know, for centuries to come. Uh, and because it was a part of their history as well. So I've always been encouraged to do that. Um, we needed an overhead bridge to get to school and we didn't have that overhead bridge. And then I just wrote to people, uh, the Majlis Dara, Kuala Kangsa, so that we could get the overhead bridge built. Whether or not it immediately produced results or not, I think my father and my mother put in us this attitude of just ask for it. Don't just wait for something to be given to you. Okay, so Gayatri Raman uh, changed LexisNexis as opposed to LexisNexis changed Gayatri Raman, right? Well, that would be nice. We can say that. Let's declare that. <laughs> okay, so let's get straight to Myanmar. Now, in uh, uh, 2011 onwards, I mean, there was this transitioning to democracy happening in Myanmar. Uh, why was that a focus point for you. How did you get to go to Myanmar? It was quite random, actually. Um, I still remember this very clearly. April 2013, I got an email from someone named Min Nang U. So Min Nang U at the time was the CEO of the Singapore International Arbitration Centre. I didn't even know he was Burmese. We just worked together on regular stuff. And uh, he emailed me and he said, I know you do a lot of rule of law work. Um, I have a friend who is working on rule of law in Myanmar. May I connect you? And I say, yes, please connect us. That friend turned out to be Robert Pei. And Robert Pei uh, was at that time Aung San Suu Kyi's legal advisor. So we got on a call. I explained what you know we are doing currently with other countries. And then he said, you have to come. And then he said, 
you can't plan a three-day meeting. It has to be at least two weeks. You need a visa. You need an invitation letter. And he arranged for Aung San Suu Kyi um, as her role as chair of Parliamentary Rule of Law Committee to issue that invitation for me so that I could get to Myanmar. I started planning my trip. I knew that I needed to meet with um, not just members of parliament or the rule of law committee in parliament. I needed to meet members of the bar, uh, the Yangon uh, Bar Association uh, as well. I wanted to meet with the law schools uh, as well. And I wanted to meet with the attorney general uh, as well. So I started putting a list together. I started calling lawyers, customers of ours in Malaysia uh, who would be able to help me uh, you know, connect me and make those meetings happen while I was there as well. So in right. August 2013, I landed in Myanmar for the first time. Right. And how long were you there for? Two weeks, that first trip. Okay. So you meet uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and, and you were advised to call her Dor Su, Dor Su. am I right? Yeah. That's right. So, yeah. So tell us about that. I still get goosebumps whenever I think about it. Um, we, I had a 4 p.m. meeting with her for 30 minutes. That morning, she was touring a um, house, like a research house for members of parliament. Um, and that was funded and organized by the National Democratic Institute. So I was invited there to just join uh, and observe her uh, during that session as well. So she came in, she walked around, um, and she looked at uh, the place that the MPs would have to research, looked at the computers, the internet, etc. So she's, she's, she was very, very hands-on. Um, she saw a Burmese woman in the kitchen. She walked into the kitchen and she started talking to her. Where are you from? Are they paying you well? Are you okay? Uh, are you take, well taken care of? You know, take care. And then she went up, went upstairs. We went to the meeting room and we started having a conversation about the needs of the members of parliament there, how, you know, they went overnight, you know, from this dark ages during military rule to having to debate sophisticated bills like the telecommunications bill, the power bill, the energy bill, the foreign investment bill. So all this is very, very sophisticated content and material. And so she was talking about how we could support, uh, you know, scaling up their skill set and their understanding and even the ability to research the law as well. I was standing in a corner and she looked at me and said, what's your name? And I said, Gayatri. And she said, come, join us. And we sat at the table and there was just nothing about it. No um, sugar coating, no, you know, talking about other things, just went straight to the point. Um, the way she was questioning the other people in the room, I was a very, I was already starting to get really, really intimidated. Um, and I knew my meeting with her was at four o'clock and I thought to myself, oh my God, I hope I survive this uh, as well. And so we completed that. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, can I, can I just stop you there before we get to that, that four o'clock meeting, which I've, I've read about and I'm sure Ambi's going to press you on. But I'd just like to, again, wind back a little bit and, and just ask you, what is it that you learned about uh, Myanmar and its legal system before you went there? Actually, there's very little. I mean, at that time, there was almost nothing. Um, they used to call themselves a common law country because of the previous British rule. We, uh, I knew that um, the law school was one of the top law schools in the past, pre-military rule. Uh, I knew that, you know, the judgments coming out of Myanmar Supreme Court was, you know, were the most cited ones um, across the region here. Uh, but I didn't know what was the situation during the military rule. Neither did I know what was the situation post-military rule. I knew uh, what I was reading on the internet at that time, and that was very little. That was just what people, I think it, it was more packaging, like, oh, we do have laws now, uh, and we are a democracy now. But I didn't, I didn't know much about uh, the country at all. So all I needed to know was to, I, I did a lot of preparation by talking to the lawyers on the ground 
and that was you know a completely different description um, versus what I was reading online. They were just telling me there was not there was not enough clarity. Uh, there were no judgments. There were decisions. There sometimes one-liners as decisions. So no rationale. Um, the laws were uncertain because people were selling them for four US dollars on the street. So you don't know what version you're getting. So whether it is an amended version or not, lawyers were telling me that, of course, there were a lot of aid agencies coming in. And of course, you know, uh, this particular country is saying you should take our law and just adopt it. The other country is saying, uh, just take our law and adopt it. So uh, the laws that were being passed by the fledgling parliament um, was many times a copy of existing laws in um, amalgamation of countries. So there was no consistency uh, as well. So Guy three, tell us how laws are passed under the military regime. Yes, just passed by decree. Um, judges were non-legally qualified. Judges were military generals. So you can imagine what the law would be, have been like, yes. <laughs> no, that's fascinating, actually, uh, uh, Gayatri, because it isn't something we're used to, you know. I mean, here, luckily, uh, our military are not interested in, in uh, <laughs> running the country, and we're very happy about that, and we hope that never changes. But to actually go to a country where the junta was uh, ruling everything, uh, but where democracy was, you know, there was a transitioning towards democracy. So you were there at a time when actually democracy was being established. Uh, so it, that must have been very, very difficult, but also very exciting for you. It was never difficult. Okay. Because it, it was just all excitement and knowing how much of that needle I can move in that country uh, with the same amount of effort, I would be moving the needle with a little bit in this country. With the same amount of effort, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm taking them by leaps and bounds during that time. Um, and I also think that it was a time when, honestly, I heard the term and the phrase, the rule of law, most often in my time in Myanmar. Whether or not they understood what it meant, people just kept going to that phrase and saying, we need rule of law. And then we started to, to define it. Like I had to ask them, what do you, what do you understand uh, by rule of law? And people would say different things, uh, just depending on their need, for example. Uh, but it was a time where everything was new to them and they were willing to absorb this knowledge that we were we were proposing to share uh, with them as well. But it was basic things like the parliament library was a very beautiful building. There were many, many people and many publishers donating legal textbooks. And when I went to tour the library, they the books were organized by donors. Nobody could find anything in the anything, library. I can imagine. Nothing. <laughs> so all we needed to do was help them catalog their, their library and help them arrange their books either alphabetically or by practice area. So it's not as if I'm doing rocket science. It's something very simple. But right after we do that, hundreds of MPs can access the library properly. That's fantastic. That's that's really quite fascinating, uh, Gayatri. So, four o'clock. Tell us about your meeting with uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. I took a book with me, Constitutional Landmarks in Malaysia. Uh, that was the only thing I, I thought of uh, that would probably resonate with her. Uh, um, she got straight to the point. She asked me what I was doing here. Uh, I said, you know, I gave a, a brief snapshot of what we were doing. And then we, she started talking about two major components. One is how do we get the working people in Myanmar, the citizenry, uh, to start using the law, respecting the law, uh, and uh, adhering to the law? 
And what does that mean in terms of practical approach and execution uh, as well? Um, we started talking about that. We talked about the need for training. Um, I had been scheduled to give a 30-minute training to the MPs on the importance of legal research the day after. Uh, she looked at her assistant and she said, you know, 30 minutes is not enough. You need to triple it. And so she just tripled the time. And then I had to just figure out what to do with the extra time uh, uh, in the curriculum uh, for the MPs as well. Um, then she started talking about um, so di the different, different kinds of laws that they were debating in parliament right now and uh, how easy or hard would it be to get some understanding about how these laws were applied in different countries and whether the mistakes were made by the different countries and whether we, Myanmar, should learn from these mistakes and not make them uh, as well. So it's very, very practical. And then on the other hand, she talked about um, helping people understand, regular people on the street to understand what the law is, what the constitution is, and how is that important in their lives. And she thought of a key thing, which was a problem in Myanmar. Um, land is not registered in Myanmar. So um, she at that time proposed uh, and tabled and, and parliament passed the farmland law of 2012. And that provided for ways in which farmers could register their interest in land. So under the constitution, um, the government owns all land, the union owns all land, but um, the, the farmland law provided for ways in which farmers could register their interests in the land that they are living on or working on. And so she asked her team to give me a copy of that in English. And we talked about how um, to educate the farmers about how important this piece of legislation is and how that can help them. And because farmers are illiterate and uh, they don't have access to the internet or anything like that, she actually challenged me to think about ways in which to make the law consumable to that group of people. And I mean, in LexisNexis, we produce content for lawyers. We don't have to worry about whether the law is consumable by illiterate people or not, right? So that really challenged me. Um, and then we discussed a radio program because at four o'clock, the farmers take tea and they all convene in a hut in their villages somewhere, and they listen to the 4 p.m. radio broadcast. And she committed to get me that 4 p.m. slot um, if I could create content which people they could hear via the radio for them to understand what the law uh, is. So we discussed those kinds of um, issues. Um, at some point, I forgot who she was. Um, but I was very, very aware. I was initially very afraid that um, the, in, the encounter would be too intimidating for me to be inspired, but I was very, very inspired. Um, she asked me whether or not I got things done. Uh, and I said, I met with people in the Yangon Law School. I met with the dean and she asked for help. She asked for books, etc. cetera. Uh, and then she said, Gayatri, you know, all these aid agencies coming in and all our people just, you know, putting their hand out. Every time people ask you for help, you have to tell them, please tell them, help themselves. Don't just keep waiting for help. And then, of course, I had this fangirl moment and I said, oh, my God, you're so inspiring. And she laughed and she said, I don't understand why people say that. It's just, you know, this is just common sense. Um, we Okay, let me cut in there, uh, Gayatri. Let me just ask you a little bit more um general things which which uh, our audience will be interested to hear. What was your... Uh, okay, did she come up to your expectations? Did you have expectations? I'm, I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit about her. Uh, did you have expectations? Did she come up to those expectations? And also, you know, what was she like? Was she always businesslike? Was she serious? You know, how, what, what did you feel? I think she was very matter-of-fact. Um, I expected her to be, uh, you know, in person, more high level. I expected to be discussing concepts of the rule of law, perhaps. Um, 
but we just went down to the practical considerations that uh, at that time was on her mind. Uh, she doesn't wait to be escorted. Uh, she did not wait um, to be introduced. Uh, she came over to me, uh, put her hand out to me uh, and said, please come, please sit. Uh, it was the same with, when I attended a training session on uh, in parliament for the MPs. There was a uh, an Indian uh, subject matter expert presenting and the translator kept getting the translator wrong in the Burmese language. And she kept interrupting the translator and correcting the translator. And then she kept, and then she said, I'm so sorry for interrupting, but we need to get this right. We need to get this right. Uh, and during the breaks, uh, tea breaks, etc., for, you know, meetings that I see her interacting with others in, she would just come up to people uh, and put her hand out and speak to people. Um, well, at that time, she was the leader of the NLD. And uh, I have never met an MP in Malaysia who came up to me like that uh, and speak to me like that when I was a complete stranger. I have never experienced that uh, in Malaysia uh, at all. Uh, I experienced um, politicians in Malaysia coming in when everybody is seated and there is a fanfare that accompanies them when they come into the room. There is a fanfare that accompanies them when they leave the room. <laughs> I didn't uh, see any of that uh, with her. So I, perhaps in my limited experience in Malaysia, I just expected more fanfare, uh, but there was less of that. Uh, in okay, terms so of meeting it, expectations, she... yep, go ahead. Yeah. she did. She far exceeded expectations. Um, she gave me the inspiration to help her country. Before going to Myanmar and meeting her, I was thinking about solving specific problems within my world. So if this was domestic violence, I would talk about domestic violence, for example, or uh, refugees or human trafficking. Uh, I, it never occurred to me that I could help 60 million people. But because she treated me like an equal and we discussed the country and she was going to lead the country, um, I came back thinking I can help every single country out there who has a land problem. I can help every single country out there who has a constitutional problem. Okay, so um, guy three, I think we all went through a phase and I, I would include myself there uh, where we were starry eyed about Aung San Suu Kyi. I mean, she was under house arrest for so many years. She came out, she started talking the right language in relation to democracy, etc. But her, uh, she lost some of her shine, for me, in her treatment of the Rohingya uh, uh, population. So I don't know if you're in a position to talk about the Rohingya and, and whether you have any views about that. Uh, would you be able to share that? I don't have first-hand knowledge of, uh, you know, conversations that may have happened between her and her teams or her and her cabinet, etc. as well. Um, I just know that um, that issue, uh, the Rohingya issue, is very, very deep-rooted uh, as well in the entire Myanmar. And it, it, it takes a long process uh, and a united uh, government to be able to address those issues. So if you are leading a kind of a government where you are expecting a, 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 the military here, you, you, know, you need to juggle a few different interests, you will never be able to tackle that topic effectively. So whatever commu official communication that came out of her, I think was a result of too much thinking about what these multiple players are feeling or demanding and trying to appease everyone at the same time, to be honest. That's my personal view. That's your personal view. Yeah, so, but it was disappointing. I mean, you were in Myanmar um, many, many times, I would imagine you visited there. Um, so how did the people of Myanmar react to, to things she was saying? They are her staunch supporters. Mm. She can do no wrong in their eyes. This is in Yangon, right? Yeah, who, uh, people. Yeah. Yes, Go ahead. I was in Yangon. I was in Naypyidaw. Um, I met with a lot of people from different parts of the country as well, Mandalay, etc. Uh, but they are Ong San Suu Kyi and what she says is Dosu is right. The lady is right. 
So do you think it's a good thing that she is so revered? It isn't. But I think if you need a uniting force, if you need something, and that something is this person, the lady, then so be it. Okay, but I think the disappointment internationally for the stance that she took in relation to the Rohingya was certainly there. But what you're saying is uh, it didn't translate into disappointment within the country itself necessarily, of course, except for the Rohingya. But uh, yeah, okay. So um, so let me talk about the uh, people in Myanmar. So you you stayed there for weeks on end sometimes. Tell us about tell us about the people of Myanmar. I'll tell you an example. Uh, and we'll we'll get to that constitutional workshop later uh, as well. But I went there. I think this was my third or fourth trip, and um, I we went for an event. We conducted a workshop. Uh, I came back exhausted. The next morning, I woke up and I realized I left my laptop at the event. This is this huge hall, and it was there overnight. I started panicking, and I started calling. Uh, my driver, you know, to come and pick me up to go and, you know, go, go and see whether the, the laptop is still there. I asked a few friends uh, and said, do you think the laptop is still going to be there? Do I need to make a police report? Like, what do I do? And every single person in Myanmar that I spoke to said, don't worry about it. It's still going to be there. In Malaysia, it would be de- gone in five minutes, right? So, and then I, I went, uh, I went over there and I, there was a wedding going on. So I couldn't get into that room. And there were a thousand guests in that hall. So I stood there. I started to talk to the people who were catering the wedding. No one could understand me. So I waited for hours and people started coming out of the hall. I went in. My bag was exactly where I put it on that chair, just against the wall. Wow. If it's not theirs, they don't touch it. Wow. So that's... Excellent. That's the kind of people the Myanmar people are. If it's not theirs, they don't touch it. Uh, If they need to share whatever little they have, they share it. That is also why the civil disobedience movement right now is still going on so strongly. That's because people who are not earning are being fed by the people who have some money uh, as well. Uh, and, And yes, they struggled with the English language. Um, so sometimes I needed a translator to help me speak with them. But there was always this excitement of meeting people from outside of Myanmar because they had been closed off from people for so long that they were embracing everything. Um, and there was always this delight and joy at their new experience uh, as well. And that was also something that I... It was very infectious to me because things that I take for granted is suddenly so delightful for them. And I I joined in that delight uh, as well. It it changed my perception in life. I stopped complaining about petty little work things. Um, I started looking at the world very differently uh, as well. Um, And I draw a lot of inspiration uh, from the people there uh, as well. Okay, so you went up and down how many times to Myanmar and, and in the in the few years that you went? So this is between. I, yeah. Well, I, I used to go there five times a year, and then wow. when I took on this role, uh, this ma- managing director role, I would go twice a year, and Hannah would go uh, more often. But yes, we we were there quite a so lot. So you know them so well. Okay, I'm going to come to uh, today a little bit later on, but I just want to ask you this. Has anyone in Malaysia ever invited you to parliament, any uh, any politician, uh, to no. talk about the rule of law and to ask you to explain laws and to uh, to run the same kind of program as you, as Myanmar did? No, none till today. <laughs> okay, none. so Myanmar Myanmar at least cares whether their MPs understand what they are passing. Okay, uh, I'm not so sure that's the same position here. <laughs> But the other thing was your your this program that you did for the farmers. I'm fascinated by that, Gayatri, because that's something we can use here, actually. Did you ever think of uh, trying to introduce that in Malaysia, where you could, through audio means, explain some of these things that matter to the people on the ground? 
yes, Tun Arifin Zakaria actually invited me to speak at the judiciary, the judges conference. Uh, and, uh, you know, we wanted to talk about how, and he actually, in his words, and I quote, Jangan asyik asyik nak tolong orang kat Myanmar, tolong juga orang Malaysia, okay? So, so he actually said that to me. Um, and uh, Tan Sri Richard Malanjun uh, also, when he was CJ, also comments conversations with me about uh, land registration in Sabah, uh, starting with East Malaysia. And we, you know, even now we are in conversations about how to do that with the pandemic. Uh, on as well. So there were conversations uh, similar to Myanmar. Um, you know, it, it hasn't progressed to that level. Uh, to be honest, because I was sensitive that land is a big deal in Myanmar uh, and to map land the way that I wanted to map land would invite a lot of um, attention from the military. And I, I was very cautious about creating the solution outside of Myanmar first uh, before going in there and then t telling people that I'm going to map uh, land as well. Oh, wow. So so tell us about this mapping of the land. What, what do you uh, mean by that, uh, Gayatri? So w remember that farmland law that I was supposed to create yes. this nice radio channel, right? I came back, started studying the law. The law actually says you need to go and register your interest in the land. And it says register at the district office or land office. So I called Dosu's team and I said, are these district office people and is the land office ready to receive these farmers coming in droves to register their interest in land? I mean, have you spoken to them yet? What am I supposed to put in my radio program, right? And they said no. So it was like a private member bill where you pass this law but then the land office is not prepared to not receive prepared, that, yeah. right? So then I said, wait, so how are we supposed to communicate this when you are going to create problems when the, the authorities, the regulators are not ready for you? And then I found out that land is not registered at all. There is no central database of land. There is no province database of land. Uh, there is no record whatsoever. There is no title, titling system, there is none of that. And if you have, you do, if you don't have a land registry system, how do you say that this land is this big and yeah. it belongs to yep. Kopal, for example? You can't. So I, I can't make use, this farmland law is meaningless to me. I can't communicate this. I need to help you. And then I thought to myself, so what does this mean? I need to create a land registry system for the country? That is that is too big, Huge. right? Yes. And, I, and I have no idea how to start. And then I researched and I found out Thailand took 50 years to do it. Yeah, everybody took decades uh, to do it and the government had to do it. And I thought to myself, wait, so land, the whole ministry and land belongs to the military, even at that uh, yeah. ecosystem. So I knew that I couldn't go and talk to the military and say, I want to map your land. Um, and I read an article in the New York Times that said that uh, this person, Rebecca Moore, helped a tribe in the Brazilian Amazon uh, track illegal logging activities using mobile devices. Mm. So then I said to myself, if you can do that, why can't I use mobile devices to crowdsource land-related information? Imagine me using a device, holding it and walking around the perimeter of my land and pushing this data into the cloud and putting my ID number, etc., in my very simplified view, I thought the solution existed somehow in Google somewhere because uh, Rebecca Moore's name was named. So I saw her on, I stalked her on Twitter. I tweeted her. She didn't reply me. I sent her a LinkedIn message. She didn't reply me. I sent an email to my chief technology officer and I said to him, uh, he was based in the US and I said to him, Jeff, She's not going to respond to me. I'm a lawyer, but you are a prospective employer. She is going to pay attention to you. So can you send her an email and get me 30 minutes of her time? He did one thing better. He sent this, he forwarded my email to every single chief technology officer in the Relax Group, which is our parent company. So all our sister companies had all these tech people, technology people who emailed me and said, don't worry, Gayatri, my sister-in-law works in Google, my brother works in Google, somebody, I'll find you somebody. Exactly two weeks later, Rebecca Moore's team emailed me and we had a conference call and I gave, I told her my idea 
and she was silent for a while. And she said, oh, my God, this is 10 times, 100 times bigger than the Brazilian Amazon project. But if it works, it's going to change the world. Can you come to Google headquarters and can you present this solution to us and we'll get all the Googlers together? So then I was invited to the Google headquarters to give this tech talk when I'm not a tech person at all. Uh, I asked my global CEO uh, and he asked me, how can I help you? And I said, I need money to travel. This is not my day job, right? So I need money to travel. And he said, this is the last thing you should worry about. You shouldn't be worrying about money. So go. And he paid for my trip. He had people go with me from our technology team to go to Google. So we spent a full day with the apps team, the maps team, the street view team, the earth team, um, brainstorming a solution where you can use mobile devices to crowdsource land-related information so you don't have to rely on the government to finally get the act together and do it. That required multiple things like, you know, making your app uh, illiterate friendly. You know, everything needs to be in symbols rather than text, for example. Uh, and how do you get the mobile devices out to people? We met with Telenor in Myanmar who was happy to work together um, because they had problems as well. They said, you know, we would be building towers. We lease land from the government. And then every week, there are farmers who say that we are on their land. And then we resolve the dispute, we pay them. And then the next week, a different group of farmers will say we are on their land uh, as well. So it is also beneficial to business uh, if we have clarity on land ownership uh, and occupation as well. So okay, uh, to cut a long story short. Yes, for the benefit of time, I want to know the end point. Did you actually come we, up with a mapping? Yeah, we have not. Uh, okay. We have solutions in mind. Uh, the progress that we made in Myanmar was we, we managed to work with the Yangon region government. We signed an MOU with them in 2019. We worked with the Yangon region government to create a roadmap um, towards creating a housing and real estate information system. So our idea is to start with the regional government. Uh, the chief minister himself gave us permission to speak to everybody. Uh, and we created a solution for it already to document and compile land. Uh, and we were supposed to execute on it, uh, you know, uh, in this period. But we haven't, we haven't been able to do that. Things have changed. So let's, let's come to today then, um, uh, Gayatri. So what you're witnessing uh, happen from the 1st of February onwards uh, must be absolutely heartbreaking for you. Yes, it is. Um, yeah. So tell tell me how you feel about that. We had, I, I can tell you that up until December 2020, um, the entire year of 2020, my team uh, had worked with the Supreme Court of Myanmar to create a online publishing platform to publish commercial cases. It included training 500 judges from 422 courts, and it included creating judgment writing templates for the judiciary. Okay? We were supposed to officially launch this platform on the 1st of February, and this happened. So I can tell you that I had to get my team together. I had to give them this pep talk to say, don't be disheartened. I mean, people were, my team were emotional, uh, tearing because of what we had, you know, achieved so far as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I just had to have that, you know, telling my team, it got to the point where we, you know, I had to have pep talks with my team to say, hey, let's focus here. Uh, let's not be too demotivated or too um, heartbroken. But we are all heartbroken. Yeah. And I think, you know, but look look at the reaction. I mean, honestly, did you expect this kind of a reaction? I mean, the, the you know, the, 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 the courage, the, you know the commitment to democracy, there is no way they're going to give up their democracy. So all those years uh, towards building up a democracy clearly worked. But it is the, it is the people, and so many, so many of them are youngsters. They are so impressive, and they are not afraid. They're not, they're not going to let this go. So were you surprised by that, or was it something you expected? That's exactly what you expected them to do? I didn't know what to expect. Um, I thought that 10 years is a short time frame. Yeah. So they would remember 
um, the, the pre-democracy period. Um, and I thought that they would just fall back to that period, to be honest. Um, mm. But uh, they were so smart. They created the civil disobedience movement first before you know the others went out to the streets. So civil servants said, I am taking a stand here, starting with the healthcare professionals. And they said, you know, we are the biggest workforce in the government and to cripple you, we have to stop and we have to strike. So they started that uh, first. And then, of course, now the rest of the people are doing it as well. But uh, from all accounts, there is real danger here. I mean, it's not tear gas we're talking about. It's live ammunition and grenades uh, that we're talking about here. And um, But I am very clear that the people that I speak to, the people that I hear on Clubhouse and other channels as well, they have weighed the pros and cons. They have weighed and considered the risks. And they are taking the risk because the risk is worth it. Okay, so there, there is this, uh, uh, this uh, cry, as it were, that they have messed, the junta have messed with the wrong generation. Is that correct? Is it the youngsters who are driving this? Yes, it is the yeah. youngsters who are driving it. Um, there are people who, who are my friends who are above 50 who have stopped talking to me. Their Facebook is shut down. Uh, and we have not been in communication at all because they are afraid. Uh, the only people who are willing to still communicate with me are the youngsters. Right. So, I mean, I think the world is 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 supports them, and and we are we it's so frustrating because our international bodies seem don't seem to be able to do anything uh, valuable to to stop this nonsense that's going on in Myanmar, and in fact, ASEAN has invited uh, General Min to attend the upcoming summit. Are you horrified by that, just like the I rest am. of us? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I am. I mean, like, I think all of us have higher expectations of ASEAN. Um, and we are the closest uh, to the country. And we need to take a stand. The ASEAN countries need to take a stand uh, and support a civilian, democratically elected government. Yes, and and you know it's also giving legitimacy to a to a government, you know, uh, to the uh, the junta who came in by a coup. Now, there is uh, some suggestion that one of the reasons why they were so angry or they felt they needed to act was because the NLD were proposing certain amendments to the constitution that would reduce their powers. Did you? Is that your view as well? I, I honestly don't know uh, what triggered uh, the coup on February 1st. Uh, but the NLD has always been very open about the need to amend this constitution. Uh, it, you know, it was there, it was vocalized, it was made very clear before the elections. Uh, it was made very clear throughout the times that uh, the constitution needs to be amended. Uh, so I, I'm i not sure what changed, changed to suddenly... Yeah, because it has been very consistent, honestly. So I, I, it's just, I, I personally think there was this miscalculation by the military. They did not expect the reaction uh, that is happening right now. Okay, I mean, they blame it on uh, fraud in the elections, but of course, it, there's no such thing, is there? <laughs> I don't yeah. believe it. Yeah, it was an overwhelming win for the NLD this time round. Now, you know, you on- someone yeah. actually, sorry to interrupt, but someone actually said in a clubhouse room, uh, this was probably a, you know, a, a, a pseudo name. So his name is Min and he is from Burma. So he's one of the protesters. And he actually said, and I quote, um, the Myanmar military would not have been so bold to institute a coup if Donald Trump hadn't been so vocal about electoral fraud in the US. Really? How interesting is that? Yeah, that's the impact you see leaders have around the world, unfortunately. Um, But that's a very interesting point that you make. 
Well, you know, but unfortunately, I, they perhaps didn't expect the reaction that they're getting. The the tragedy is that so many people have to die, you know, children included, young people, and and that you know the military is is just uh, not 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 stopping. So I mean, it, it's strange, I suppose, to see the military in parliament. I think that's something that we're not we're not familiar with. You know, is did you ever visit parliament when? Yes, multiple times, okay. multiple times, and there were people. Uh, the military were in full uniform. That's uh, right, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. It, I mean, they should I, be passing it, it laws. It made me uncomfortable. Yeah. It made me right. uncomfortable as well. Yes. Yeah, it's incongruous, isn't it? When you talk about democracy and laws and the rule of law, and then the military is sitting in parliament, it must be something very difficult to yeah to to accept, right? So anyway, uh, sometime in March, uh, Gayatri, you tweeted that you had a heartbreaking conversation with a friend in Yangon. So could you tell us about that? Yes. She is a lawyer. Uh, she is a Burmese lawyer. And uh, I call her every week or so. And um, on that night, I, I called her and I said, how are you doing? And she started whispering and she said, oh, my God, I almost got shot. Um, today, Guy Tree, and she said, "You know, I went out to buy something, and um, I bumped into the military. They saw me. I saw her. I saw them, and I started running. And she was just describing running. And she said, I was running, and I was running, and they were chasing me, and they were shooting. I wasn't sure whether they were shooting at me or whether they were just shooting at someone else. But I kept running, uh, and I kept jumping over the drains, and I I fell." And then she said, I fell and I couldn't get back up because I was so tired and bullets whizzed past me and bullets hit the wall in front of me and I thought I was going to die. And out of the blue, someone just ran past me and lifted me up and I picked myself up and I ran and I ran home. And she was whispering to me because her parents didn't know about her whole encounter. Her parents are worried sick about her. And of course, she didn't want to worry them further. So she went into her room and she started whispering uh, and telling me the story as well. And I said to her, oh my God, you need to be careful. Uh, please take care of yourself. And she said, well, you know, I, my parents, my dad won't let me protest on the streets. So I'm banging pots and pans at night uh, at 8 p.m. And then she said, what else can I do, Gayatri? What else can I do? But then when I started banging pots and pans and my neighbors started doing it, they started shooting into our homes. So they started opening fire into their homes. Her living room has bullets and bullet holes. Um, and her father kneeled in front of her and begged her not to bang the pots and pans. And she had to stop. So how do people in Myanmar feel at the moment? They feel abandoned. They are Dis disappointed, frustrated. Uh, I mean, this friend of mine actually said to me, and she said, the bar, you know, the Myanmar Bar Associations are not saying anything. The lawyers are not saying anything. Why are the lawyers not saying anything? So, you know, she she's saying, she said, I, you know, there are people going on the streets, but that's it, as individuals, not as an association. Why are we not getting together? And she's the one who said it to me. She said, you know, Yangon Bar has, hasn't issued a statement. You know, Myanmar hasn't issued a statement. The state bars haven't issued statements. Um, and she is even frustrated with that uh, as well. Not just, um, you know, ASEAN or the United Nations or any or uh, EU, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, she is also uh, feeling uh, more and more frustrated that she can't do more to help. So I think people on the streets just need to feel like they're doing something. Uh, and so they are out on the streets. Uh, because they are so isolated, uh, I, I think there's a lot of intellect and energy there um, that is just brewing. Um, yes. And to be honest, uh, I think that we, you know, it, Regional and international bar associations, neighboring national bar associations, lawyers, I call on all these associations, step up, support the Myanmar lawyers, help them organize themselves, help them structure the protests so that it doesn't turn into civil war, help them, you know, work within protests within the parameters of the rule of law, 
um, and lawyers are the ones who can guide uh, the revolution as well. So step up, step up, get together, help your brothers and sisters. Guy three, that's an ex- excellent suggestion. And one thing I will say, the bar here will not hesitate. If 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 people knew what to do, you know, I mean, and we look at our government. I mean, the issue statements, I, all of which mean nothing unless it's followed up with action. So we are just as frustrated. I I can't bear to watch the news sometimes when you look at children being killed, etc. And and the biggest frustration is against ASEAN, actually. It's unforgivable that they're not doing something more. But going back to rule of law, I mean, you worked for how many years, right, at trying to build up the rule of law. So this must be a huge, huge setback. Um, I mean, although they say that they will lift this emergency in one year, uh, this has done Myanmar a lot of harm. I agree. When I speak to my team, I'm trying to talk about the fact that to remind them that, you know, don't think that the last seven years has been a waste. Please don't think that way. Um, and I, I think we can, I, even I can get consumed in the misery of it all uh, when I look at it now. Um, but, you know, they did emerge from the dark ages. You know, they had 60 years of darkness and then they emerged, right? So it is an evolution um, and it is something that we have to keep note of. Don't give up on them. They're still there. The people there are struggling on the ground and they want it. So we have to support it however we can as well. Um, LexisNexis and the IBA actually collaborated some years ago on something called the Eyewitness to Atrocities app. So it is an application on the phone. You download it and you record atrocities, war crimes mm. to be used as evidence in court. So LexisNexis stores it in our servers. Uh, to preserve the integrity, uh, the chain of evidence, right? Oh, right. Um, we have been working on the ground uh, with NGOs, with um, the people on the ground, the, the civilian government as well, to train them on how to use this app. Instead of Facebook live streaming, for example, please use this app so that we can document it um, for court later. We have 3 million downloads, but barely a fraction of them are actually using the app. Uh, to document as well. So that's also something that we are doing, you know, to in support working with the eyewitness team uh, as well. Okay, um, last words, uh, um, Gayatri. Unless, Gopal, you have any other questions? Um, okay, so look, let's, why don't you give us some concluding remarks about Myanmar and, and how you think we should be more helpful and what we can do to help, yeah around the world, actually? I would say lawyers. Lawyers are a very powerful group of people. And because of where the state of the protest is in Myanmar and the danger of it turning into full-fledged civil war, I think we need to help uh, the protesters organize themselves, structure themselves, um, conduct themselves according to the rule of law and keep that in their radar and their vision as well so that they don't lose perspective. And I think lawyers, there are millions and millions of us around the world. We should be the ones helping them organize themselves and organize this protest into a stronger, smarter, more strategic one uh, as well. So my last concluding remarks is a call to action to all lawyers out there. Thank you so much, Gayatri. That is Absolutely fascinating. I wish we had more time uh, because you you you're so you un- understand completely what's happening on the ground uh, in Ma- in Myanmar, and your input has been absolutely invaluable. Thank you for all the work that you do for the rule of law. Um, thank you, Gopal. Anything else that you want to add? Gayatri, thank you very much for being part of our podcast. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Gayatri. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Bully, the podcast. Follow us on our social media pages so you can catch our other episodes.